This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, 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 Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. But today is one of my most favorite uh, hot subjects that I get in a lot of trouble with. It's a subject called education. And if you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you know it's this book on education. My rich dad was a man who never went to school. And the reason was when he was 13 years old, his father died and he was a small business guy. So, so Rich had to take over the family business at 13. So he grew up in the real world of business. And my poor dad was an academic genius, a very smart man. I mean, great guy, great father. Both men are great fathers, tough guys. But my poor dad, you know, graduated from the University of Hawaii in two years, a four year school. Then he spent his summers going to Stanford, University of Chicago, Northwestern. He never got his advanced degree. So he had a two year college degree, never got an advanced degree, but he eventually became a PhD, you know, because they just said, this guy's got so much education behind of him. And, uh, but as a kid, Growing up in Hawaii, I saw my rich dad getting rich, richer and my poor dad getting poorer. I'm going, there's something wrong here. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so by the time I was 15, or I was pretty, con- not confused, but conflicted. And then I, I did go to a great school, U.S. Merchant Marine Academy at Kingsport, New York, even though I flunked out of high school my sophomore year and my senior year. And it's not that I'm stupid, it's that I just disagreed with the teachers. You know, I, yeah. Yeah, I just couldn't stand them. And they're good people, but they had their point of view, I had my point of view. And I go to the Merch Marine Academy in New York, it's one of the five federal schools, Navy, Air Force, Marine, Army, and Coast Guard, and the Merch Marine Academy, supply chain, by the way. And I said, I like this better. And the reason I like King's Point better, it was we learned by doing. We had to drive ships. So I, if you, you could either drive a ship or you couldn't, then I joined the Marine Corps to fly, and you could either fly or you couldn't fly. There wasn't any memorization of answers. But I think education today is under tremendous criticism, and justly so. So I have two fabulous guests this morning, mother and daughter team. We have Jennifer DeStefano and Brianna DeStefano. And they're going to talk about what's going on in school systems in specifically Arizona where we live, but it's also a very high-end school. So we can't mention the name because we don't want Brianna, you know, tarred and feathered like, uh, you know, what they do in schools today. <laughs> so welcome to the show, uh, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank G- you for having us. Give us a little bit of your background and how, how this whole thing starts. Um, I've lived in Arizona since 1989, and I've been born and raised through the public school system out here um, and had my own experiences growing up, um, had some... Uh, differences of opinion sometimes that were taught in school and um, met those myself um, throughout the years. So when we had kids, we decided we wanted to um, put our children into environments where they didn't have the same type of political influences um, or that was what we strove for. Obviously, times change, agendas changed. Um, we recently switched a couple schools and uh, went from private to public with one of, with our two younger children and uh, came across a school board situation. Had no <laughs> idea what was going on. We had just joined the school system uh, for a couple weeks at that point in time and got thrown into the middle of that. And before you know it, I'm on Fox News in the dossier being hunted no down kidding. by the school board. Yes, <laughs> um, because I opposed some of the things that were going on. Um, and then from there, uh, I have two older children that were both in private and how many children do you have total four four Um, Uh boys girls uh two boys two girls same as my family two boys two girls yeah it's a great uh, mix my mother had four kids in four years boy she was busy (laughs) i had four kids in five years (laughs) i feel her pain a lot of it (laughs) i'll pray for you tonight (laughs) (laughs) thanks i can use all the prayers Um, but our oldest uh, was at a private school, and again, the political agenda took 
control uh, over the school. And so we had to uh, remove him and put him into a different school that was more like-minded. Uh, why did you have to remove him? What happened? Uh, it was during when they wanted to make a stand about the vaccines and vaccine mandates. And uh, my son has a medical history and that wasn't uh, acceptable. So there was no allowances for any oh. uh, variation to the rule. Or you take the jab or go. Yep, 100%. Yep, exactly. And you know, today, for, for those, this was an international program, but today, I mean, the Department of Justice, Merritt Garland, the, I guess he's the Attorney General, whatever he is, any parent that questioned the school board was called a terrorist now. Yep. It's shocking. Yeah, so in the dossier, they actually had a screenshot of my Facebook page. My Facebook was broken into. It was oh. hijacked. I had to start a new Facebook page, um, and they took a screenshot. So they had an alias that they were using to try and gain friends uh, with me on my Facebook, as well as they had my background report. They had my great grand. They had my grandmother's, her great grandmother's address. They had. Uh, They're trying to find what cars we own, what houses we own. Um, an entire background search on me. It's that vicious. That vicious that, after only being in the system for three weeks. Wow. This is a very, I didn't know it was that bad. So that's why we invited them on um, both Jennifer and Brianna, mother and daughter. We met at Eli Crane's uh, political event. And then uh, my friend Harriet Hagman out of Montana. I mean, she is one tough woman. Yes, she is. And so it's fabulous. Eli is a you know, US Navy SEAL. So we're all fighting back right now. So, Brianna, you're uh, 15 years old. Yes, just 15. And what was, what's your, because you go to a very, very good private school. We're not going to mention the name because of obvious reasons. But what's been your experience of school at um, 15? You know, so following in my parents' path, I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. So <laughs> <laughs> You're in trouble already. <laughs> it's going to be a tough road for you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was taught the game cash flow when, uh, oh. a few years ago growing up, you know, reading your book. So I really wanted to take some classes to learn to become an entrepreneur and see what they like offered for me. I tried last year, but you know, um, they didn't let any freshmen in for the first few years for entrepreneur classes or business or anything. So this I had in high school. Yeah. So I had to wait till this year to get into the most basic level. And um, <laughs> what did they teach you? <laughs> and I'm going in and, you know, I'm ready to learn like what I need to know and some skills. And it's just it's the most basic level of things you need to know. And they're teaching kids that like. I'm an introvert myself, and they're making us take tests online to, to tell us if we're an extrovert or an introvert. And, you know, if we're not an extrovert, it won't be, we won't be a successful entrepreneur. And if, we, if we're an introvert, apparently we need to find people that will help us that are, have, like, those extroverted attributes to become our business partners. And I'm sitting here, and I'm like, this is not true. Like, I've been an introvert most of my life, and uh, I, I am too. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Most of the, most of the most successful entrepreneurs are introverts. You know, they they spend time by themselves, or you know, they that's how people like grow and think is spending time by themselves. <laughs> and and um, so in class, you know, she's teaching us that if we're not an extrovert, then you know what we just it's too much of a risk and we need to find a job that will suit our attributes. And so she's making us like pulling up literal tests like online that tell us like who we need to be or like what career path we need to go down. And I'm like, I'm not taking this. Like I know who I want to be and what career I want to go down. Like yeah. I don't need a test online to tell me what I need to be. And then she goes on to tell us like the, all the famous entrepreneurs and like you know, she tells us that Bill Gates defines his, his success off of like foreign vaccines rather than his own business, and and I'm sitting there wow. and, I, and I'm like, so the indoctrination I begins into the I, back. Exactly, you know, and she teaches uh, like the school will teach us that. Um, and the right now, she thought that we were going into a um, instead of a recession, she thought we were going into a um, what's it called? She thought that we we're a recovery, recovery, a recovery. So she's teaching our class that we're going into recovery. And I'm like, we're about to go into like depression, a depression, like yeah. a recession, even if like, and, and everyone, she's like, she didn't know, like after COVID, like now we're going into recovery, the economy is coming back. And I'm like, what is going on? Like, I'm just sitting there. 
I just don't even want to listen anymore. I don't want to do any of the assignments. Like, because I'm actually in this class. Most kids, you know, they're not even in this class because they want to learn. They're in this class because, you know, they were told it's an easy A. They get some easy, easy homework. A. Yeah. Oh, well, I was signed up for that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm over here and I'm like, I'm talking to the counselor and I'm like, can I get into like any other business class, you know, like personal finance? Like, I'll take the most basic level of entrepreneurship, but this is just like not working for me. And, um, you know, that's what, that's what the school is teaching us right now. And, you know, um, my favorite book of yours is, um, the book you wrote called fake, you know, it's all about, <laughs> it's I all, love this girl. I love her. I love her. You're a very smart young lady. It's all Definition about, of intelligence. If you agree with me, you're intelligent. You disagree with me. You're not. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, <laughs> And the book you wrote um, on fake, it's all about like fake teachers, fake assets, fake money. And I'm sitting there and. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonder I'm not being tarred and feathered right now. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, the book in the back of the classroom I'm reading is the teacher walks back. It, it has plastered on it what the school system doesn't want you to know with fake teachers. <laughs> and so um, <laughs> I really love how, you know. Well, let the, me defend myself now. <laughs> 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 no, but the reason I, I call them fake is they teach subjects they don't practice. Oh, ex exactly. You know, that's it. That's exactly the issue is yeah. the teacher doesn't have an entrepreneurship background. So she was really coming at it from a perspective of, of never having to practice or understand exactly Correct. what it is she's teaching. And they tell you don't make mistakes. Mm -hmm. How can you be an entrepreneur or anybody if you don't make mistakes? Those yeah, mistakes are how we exactly. learn. Exactly. Yeah. 100%. If you're not willing to take the risk, then you're never going to learn or grow. And like, how many businesses fail in order for you to find something that actually is successful? Yeah. Once again, this is no November 2022. You know, Halloween just passed. Was your teacher driving a broom on Halloween? <laughs> 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 well, but mine were, as far as I was concerned. You know, what I mean, no, yeah. I had I had like five great teachers, mm -hmm. and yeah. three were men, two were women. They were just yeah. they inspired. Yeah. But the rest were just witches and yeah. Oh. I had some wonderful, you know, what you say on that, there's some wonderful teachers out there. I really do appreciate and champion for a number of teachers that put their neck out on the line, right. really do love the children, really do want to see the children succeed. And um, we've been very grateful to those teachers who've been those champions Correct. Correct. throughout time. And then there is the other side of it, too, where you definitely have the teachers who are there because whether they're tenured or, or an agenda. Or an agenda, exactly. And so the problem is, is that education has become infiltrated with the agenda or with the apathy um, that comes along with tenure. So, uh, you know, it's such a hard mix because it's hard to label as a generality, but at the same sense, too, like you're saying before, if they don't have a background in the subject matter that they're teaching as well, where are we growing with this? And so when she came home and she's sharing with me about entrepreneurship and what she's learning in the class, she's like, I watch you guys. I know this isn't true. Like her father's an introvert too. <laughs> so, <laughs> I am too. I'm like, so, you know, we would sit and we geek out when we were younger and we would just do market trends. That's what we did on a Saturday night is mm -hmm. we would literally sit and, and trend different real estate zip codes and markets and, and you do grow that way. And so to label and classify these young kids at such a young age, it's already kind of breaking them down before you can even build them up. Right. That's personal development. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, need, you want to learn to be an extrovert, you can learn that. Yeah, ex it, yeah anything can be learned. Uh, that's why I have to learn public speaking, because that's a fear greater than yeah. death for most people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And when I, you know, when Kim met me, she said, I had to do like a two minute introduction of my CPA. And um, she said, I never saw a guy practice so hard, but that's the U.S. Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. You know, we had great teachers and you knew who the great pilots were. Do you know what I mean? That we knew, we knew who could fly and who couldn't fly. And we always wanted to fly with the best pilots just coming back from Vietnam. Right. And so, but you could tell the guy or we had no females at that time pilots. We knew the guy could fly or not. You know, you could just watch them say, the guy can't fly. Yeah. There were guys who couldn't fly, you know yeah. what I mean? So what upsets you the most about that whole, what's in your gut, what was going on with you? Why Why am I here? Why am I doing, taught this? Or well, What upsets me the most is, so I used to just sit and read your books during snack or break. And I tried <laughs> I tried to, you know, my friends would be sitting there looking at me. They're like, Brianna, what 
are you doing? And, I, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, I'm trying to start this business right now. And you know, it's I, an easy A. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, what infuriates me the most is actually that like these kids, they won't understand what being a true entrepreneur is. If all they're taught is that like, it's too risky. They can't do it. If they have these attributes, you know, it's just not worth it. You should just go find your high paying job, your biggest degree, you know, get the most income you could possibly get. And it's like, but people don't understand the benefit of what being an entrepreneur is if they like are being taught this in school. So what was the upset? Well, that's, that's when I get it. That's, that's the logic of it, where they think, like, what, what, goes, what goes on inside of you? You know, like mine was just rage almost, I'm going. Oh yeah, I'll be, yeah, I'll be sitting there and I'll be so mad, especially if it comes from students. Cause I've been told so many times, I don't know what I'm talking about, you know, cause I'm younger. So apparently like, since I'm younger and I don't know what I'm talking about, the teachers do. And um, it just annoys me so much that like kids automatically just, they take a ma like what the teachers say and they just automatically believe it rather than what I have to say for coming off of your books. And it's not just like my opinion, it's like real logical facts. It's what my parents do. It's everything. And, and well, at least you are reading in the back of the classroom. <laughs> <laughs> I went to my, my high school reunion and I took Kim with me. And I said, hey, Kim, this is Sylvia, this is Sylvia. And the key to success for, I was a surfer, you know, the key to success is always sit next to the smartest girl and copy. <laughs> <laughs> that is so many kids' tactics these days. <laughs> so I sat down and I said, oh, Kim, this is Sylvia. And I sat her all through class. She goes, Sylvia looks at Kim, she goes, he never sat next to me. He climbed out the window and go surfing. <laughs> 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 well, he sits there. You can see the waves going. Why am I here? You know, you could. You know, the surf, once a surf past like six feet, terror goes up because six foot waves. It just depends on how you measure them. In Hawaii, a six foot wave is a twenty foot wave in California. You know, I mean, they're different me measurables. You see a six foot wave, and you could see it out the window and going. Why am I here? So I just jump out. Yeah. <laughs> it was like after I graduated college and I finally had my degree and I had my corporate job and I'm going to do the corporate world. And I'm sitting there in this cubicle looking out this little window, watching it rain, going, why am I here? Yeah, yeah, and I yeah. learned real fast. And yeah. I exited the corporate world about 10 months. But that's when you know you're an entrepreneur. 100%. Yeah. And I left and that never looked back. Okay. So we come back with going more into with these two beautiful young women here, Jennifer DeStefano and Brianna DeStefano. We're talking about what's going on our school system because um, my friend says this is not, it's not education, it's indoctrination. And I wrote about it in uh, my book, Capitalist Manifesto. You know, we now have what's called, uh, I forgot the name of the education system, but it's really indoctrination mm -hmm. into Marxism. We write back. Robert's been warning us for years. His golden rule, invest in real assets. That's how he didn't just survive the last period of catastrophic inflation, he thrived, turning one property into an empire of over 7,000. Inflation be damned. But with the Fed raising interest rates again last week, this time around could be even worse. We could be on the verge of another historic crash. Now, BlackRock CEO Larry Fink, the largest asset manager in the world, says there's one real asset that investors need to know about because of its resilience during times like these. Fink even calls it the new gold. He's talking about fine art. The last time inflation was this high, fine art appreciated an average of 17.5% per year. That's more than stocks and real estate in that same period. Now, you can invest in fine art for a fraction of what billionaires like Fink pay. All thanks to Masterworks, it's the new tech platform that lets you invest in shares of paintings by legends like Picasso and Banksy. Masterworks has produced incredible results. Like in early October, when Masterworks sold a painting for 21.5% net return. In fact, six of Masterworks' seven exits have returned over 20% net to their investors. And four of those exits were this year alone. With inflation still soaring and major economic markers flashing red, the next six months could be some of the most important of your investing life. Paintings have sold out in minutes on Masterworks, but you can get priority access. Going to masterworks.art slash richdad. That's masterworks.art slash richdad. See important disclosures at masterworks.com slash cd. 
Hey everyone, it's Sarah at the Rich Dad Radio Show. Let me tell you, good sleep is the ultimate game changer and the 8 Sleep Pod is the ultimate sleep machine. I live in Arizona. It's over 100 degrees today and it's only expected to get hotter throughout the week. And the pod is the only sleep technology that dynamically cools and heats each side of the bed to maintain the optimal sleeping temperature for what your body needs. With the pod, you can start sleeping as cool as 55 degrees Fahrenheit or as hot as 110 degrees Fahrenheit. And clinical data shows that eight sleep users experience up to 19% increase in recovery, up to 32% improvement in sleep quality, and up to 34% more deep sleep. And 8sleep recently just launched the next generation of the pod. The new pod 3 enables more accurate sleep and health tracking with double the amount of sensors delivering you the best sleep experience on earth. And all you need to do is go to 8sleep.com slash richdad to start sleeping cool this summer and save up to $150 on the pod. 8sleep currently ships within the USA, Canada, the UK, select countries in the EU and Australia. Feeling powerless over current events and your financial future? Financial freedom is your freedom. Robert Kiyosaki is the best-selling author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Over 40 million people have taken Robert's advice. Now it's your turn. Attend Robert's free virtual wealth building event. Claim your free access now at richdadfree.com. Don't wait, access is limited. Go to richdadfree.com. That's richdadfree.com. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. Good news and bad news about money today. We have a very spectacular guest, uh, Jennifer DeStefano. She is the mother of Brianna DeStefano. And we're talking about the most important subject of a person's life, and it's called education. And as if you're an adult over 20, I think you know now that education doesn't take place only in school. You know, it takes place in real life and all this. And so we're talking about it, we're being very critical, yet education is the most important subject. Unfortunately, many of our teachers are also indoctrinated because, you know, I couldn't be a school teacher. I mean, I just would not put up with that mm, stuff. Yet education is very important. We've all had great teachers. You know, one of my, one of my best teachers was so old, she forgot how old she was. And my, my father was, and I'm not kidding you. <laughs> she was one of the best teachers I ever had because she put up with me. And um, I mean, my father said, I, I hate to tell you this, Miss So-and-so, but you went past your retirement age. <laughs> I loved her, man, because she understood me. Do you know what I mean? Yes. She was a great, great spinster. No, never had, never had a husband and all that. Had a hair in a bun like the other teachers. And I, I thought they drove. Uh, I thought the other teachers drove brooms on Halloween. You know, I'm going, holy mackerel! I'm just being punished all the time. I'm a boy. <laughs> Anyway, so that's what, but we're not saying education is bad. I said it was turned to indoctrination, no longer education. So do you have any suggestions or, you know, you, you took a on and you got n nailed for that one. So would you suggest parents take on the school boards? Um, I would suggest that parents definitely get involved. Um, the thing that I see a lot of is, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a curriculum snob, so I get very involved in what are what's the math curriculum, what is the social studies curriculum. I ask for the curriculums, I read through the curriculums, um, and I've selected schools based off of their curriculums. Um, but a lot of other parents, and I don't want to, I don't want to like make it seem negative, but they just trust the system, and so they don't get that involved. And they're like, well, they're the educator, so they know better. And then when they, I think a lot of eyes were open during COVID when we were homeschooling and they started to see some of the stuff that were being taught <laughs> or they started to evaluate and why can't I teach my third grader basic math? This makes no sense. Um, then they started to get more of a voice and then that voice started to be heard at the school boards and then the school boards didn't like the voice and then the school boards tried to dampen the voice by having closed meetings when they're supposed to have open meetings. And then that made a group of parents speak up even more. And so now we've got the election coming up, right? When we've got two school board members members in Scottsdale School District turning over and for I'm happy to see more parents getting more involved now more people more community members becoming leaders to try and take back our schools to try and champion for our children and 
because we we were all asleep, very much asleep, that we just thought that the educational system was the educational system. We didn't realize the political infiltration that had been going on. We'd been seeing it subtly with math, but not so much with the other things. My kids would come home. We'd play cash flow, literally. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and uh, I will never forget this. My uh, They were in middle school at the time. Brianna was in seventh and Alex was in eighth. And um, when you have a baby, right, it becomes a liability. It is an expense. And so <laughs> well, th- th- I caught hell for that one on my game board. <laughs> what do you mean a baby is a liability? I said, you ever have one? <laughs> <laughs> I have four. So, yes, I'm very aware of that one. Um, so but uh, Brianna had a, a baby in the game. And Alex said, well, you know, you can just have an abortion and and, and absolve the liability. And my husband and I both looked at him and we're like, where did you learn this? And meanwhile, our youngest was born. Who uh, said you can have an abortion? My my eighth grader at the time. 13? Uh, yeah. Well, Probably. I, at the time, also didn't, I agree with that because that's what my school was teaching me too, you know, like. That was what we found out. Yeah. So their youngest brother was born premature. Uh, he almost died from a genetic disorder. So I pulled out photos of him as they went through that and they watched the suffering. I'm like, this could be your brother. This gestational age could have been your brother. And and so we had that whole conversation and, and the kids eyes opened and, but they had been taught at school that that was another form yeah. of birth control. No, yeah, completely. It's- but so getting more involved in that, you know, I think the parents stepping up, the parents having a voice, the parents asking the questions, the parents questioning things. Um, and then also getting to know the teachers, uh, you know, I've, unfortunately there's a number of teachers that feel pressured into perpetuating the conversation. Oh, right. Exactly. And they're concerned for their livelihood as well. Um, so the more, we can support them and the more that they know that we're on the same side instead of being their adversaries the more we can accomplish with our kids right and that's one of the reasons i became i made i made a decision so i can be entrepreneurship when i came back from vietnam my poor dad wanted me to fly for the airlines you know Mm -hmm. oh yeah as a helicopter gunship pilot you don't want me as a pilot of your aircraft and then he wanted me to get my phd and i said i wind up like him and then i realized what trapped my dad was that paycheck and a pension yeah. And I went, okay, so I'm, I was like 25 at the time, and I said, I'm never gonna need a paycheck, I'm never gonna need a pension. And then it's when I, I was, I've been studying for my rich dad since I was 10 anyway, then I said, okay, I'm gonna follow him. Yeah. But not go to get my PhD or become a pilot for the airlines, you know? Not yeah. that I would mind of that, but I was, I had said, I better take the risk now, because yeah. I will fail. Well, to your point, exactly. Um, some of the moms that were being pursued by the school board, um, there is a story of the nurse where uh, the actually contacted her employer and filed a complaint and got her to lose her job. And so there was a number of, uh, even with out just Scottsdale Unified School District with one of the other schools that was going on, I had parents calling me as well saying they were going to lose their jobs if they had a voice. And so they were asking me because I chose not to have the pension and chose not to have the liability of someone else controlling me to if I would speak up because I wasn't at risk of losing my livelihood like they were. Yeah. And that's why, you know, I, one of my first, when Rich Dad, Poor Dad came out, I started, you know, Trump and I, we're, we're, we've written two books together. Mm-hmm. We started recommending people get into network marketing mm-hmm. because yeah. it's a low entry. You can fail all you like and you don't lose that much. You know, you lose some time and lose some ego and lose some friends. But network marketing will teach you how lifetime income. Yep. Oh, completely. And yeah. then you're you're free. So yep. that's why we endorse it and that's what we caught hell for that one too. But anyway, but that's why I have tremendous respect for the former president Donald Trump and I would vote for him if he ran again. But he would be disruptive as usual. <laughs> <laughs> I come from New York, so when he ran for president I was like, Yes. <laughs> All right, right. Let's fight back. So, um, what do you recommend parents do to you know in in the Marine Corps pilots fly cover for us. So like when the troops were on the ground, our most important job was to fly cover for the troops. And mm-hmm. so if somebody popped up, we take care of them, oh, yeah. <laughs> hammer them. But anyway, so how does, uh, how, what would you say to parents how to fly cover for the students? Well, it all depends on the type of parent, you know, <laughs> well, that, no, that, that, that doesn't answer the question. <laughs> As a kid, you ain't got any choice there. <laughs> Well, um, what would you say to your parent who was ambivalent or not committed either way? Well, Speak for all the young people out there. <laughs> I would just say that be more aware of like what the teachers are teaching in the classroom, you know, like get involved 
like ask what the curriculums are like she did you know really try like look at the homework understand what the teachers are teaching in class you know and if it's not right you make a statement about it because that's what your your kids your kids are being taught so either way like if you don't like it and you you don't either way if you don't know what they're teaching like if you never like look what they're teaching in class you're never gonna know what your kid's being taught so it's always good just to see what they're teaching in class to always know like if you want your kid to be taught that and that's what I would say to my mom but she already does that so yeah. <laughs> so let me ask, but let me ask this question you also have peer pressure right your classmates oh, completely what, what happened there because you have the you know the goody two shoes who just <laughs> the teacher's pet and all that which obviously never was but anyway what do you say, how, do, how does a young person handle peer pressure? Um, well, for me growing up, peer pressure always played like a big role in my life until I started to find like friends that actually just taught me that it's better to just not care and do what you love and wow. like need to. You had friends tell you that? <laughs> Your age? Yes. Wow. <laughs> once you find good ones, once you go through enough, you <laughs> You'll find the good ones. Well, all my friends were all drug dealers, but I couldn't <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> I grew up with a bunch of characters, all surfers, you know, and, and they, they had their, they were growing pakalolo marijuana. They, uh, they, they yeah. saw their future, that lifetime oh, income and yeah. all this. Well, but, they're all sitting in nice businesses now because it's legal. <laughs> yeah, but you know, they, I said, well, what, 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 kind of, what business are you in? They said, we're in tropical agriculture. I said, oh, <laughs> marijuana, yes. <laughs> and they said, we'll spend some time in jail, but that's part of the price. I said, okay, yeah. you guys, I'm not, I'm not gonna follow you, you know. Yeah, and I but was you gonna... can be a friend but you don't have to go along with them. Yeah, completely. But I was going to say, um, going along with the peer pressure, that's what made it so difficult. Like for me trying to explain to my friends, you know, what I wanted to do with my life and being an entrepreneur. And, they're, you know, after a while, they like started to realize that like I was really serious about this and they started to listen to what I had to say and started to like understand. And, um, but it's really difficult if you just go up to like a random kid in high school and you, and like in your class and you try to explain to them like, what you've been taught, like they, they won't listen. And so peer pressure plays a big role in that, especially like if you get bullied for it or judged, like people just don't even try to understand what other right. kids are saying. There's a lot of bullying going yeah. on. I mean, I, I, I got bullied also, you know, yeah. but that's growing up. Yeah, exactly. It's growing it's up. It's part of it. So I'm going to ask you know, a couple of things. When I ask a question, why did you recommend the cash flow game? And then what did you learn? But before I go on, you look, some of the greatest entrepreneurs in the world never went to school or didn't finish school. Yeah. Walt Disney, Steve Jobs of Apple, Michael Dell, uh, Bill Gates, uh, Richard Branson, and you look at some of the great entrepreneurs, they, they saw no need for the final education. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying drop out of school, but that's a big decision. You know, I thought about dropping out many, many times, especially as I was flunking out anyway, so. Mm -hmm. But I fought back, which was the best thing. I, I, mean, I didn't fight back, I mean, um, with the teacher. I just buckled down and studied, Yeah, yeah. you know. And my last, my final exam at the academy was eight days long. It was a Coast Guard exam to get my license. It was the hardest exam. And the threat was if I didn't pass the Coast Guard exam for my third mate's license to sail the, sail the seas, I didn't get a college degree either. So it, it all came down to eight days of testing. And I passed, you know, and I was, I didn't smoke, but I got out, I took a cigarette. I was so nauseous, you know, I, think <laughs> I couldn't believe it. But when the guy looked up at me and says, congratulations, mate, third mate, you know, I'm going, wow. I made it. Then I get then I get my bachelor of science degree in ocean transportation, which is supply chain, with a minor in oil. Oh. You know, so it was a great education, but I'm glad I buckled down to study to get that. So why did you recommend the cash flow game to your uh, to Brianna? Um, so when cash flow first came out, we used to do the groups that would be downtown and you get together and play. Oh, good. Yeah. Right. Way back. Um, so absolutely fell in love with the game. So when we had kids, we what, knew. What were you learning when you played the game? What was I learning? Good. Um, I was Wait, learning. I hear so many parents say, how come I didn't know this? You know. Um, well at that time I had just graduated college and that's when I had decided I didn't want to do corporate America anymore. And so I knew I, actually what happened was, is when I was traveling around, I was an outside acquisition sales, I was, um, 
training a new sales rep, and he was just a businessman to no degree. He had cattle in his backyard so he could write his house off as a ranch. Uh. He, <laughs> he collected manure at the zoo and turned them into molds and then sold them to gardeners and whatnot to fertilize their garden with an old washing machine in his backyard. Guy? Well, he was hired by the company I worked yeah, for, right, and right. I was training with him. And so, and we would uh, t- go down to the courthouse, took, and we he would. Took, he took cow shit and turned them yep. into oh, more animal he, shit. He sold them. the business for twenty five thousand well, dollars. Yeah, I want to say something. So yesterday, that's my kind of entrepreneur. It was elephant shit, actually. <laughs> Mom, that goes back to yesterday. It was on my sister's birthday, and. Um, you know, we wanted to get her a funny gift, so we went to the store, and you know, they're literally selling rocks as pet rocks, yeah, yeah, and yeah. they're making a market out of that, and just selling rocks. Well, that's what it got me into the entrepreneurship. We had the pet rock, yeah, yeah. and this guy's making a fortune. He finally realized he didn't need the rock; he just sold the box. Yeah, yeah. Well, holy moly, that's an entrepreneur. You know? Yeah, yeah. So I was learning all these alternatives, and I knew of our ch- children as we grew up, and we learned all these alternatives and different types of investments and whatnot that we wanted to continue that with our kids oh, so that they could you. continue thank on you. and learn you know how different types of revenue streams and how to support themselves without the conventional ways so the, so the title of the game is how to get out of the rat races yes because otherwise you're heading into the rat race yes right out of college yes exactly, exactly. And, yeah. and I realized really fast that was not where we wanted to be and fortunately that's not where we are today so we got out of that. If you don't mind, what kind of businesses are, what, what, do, you, what do you guys do? Um, we have a bunch of different businesses, everything from healthcare to manufacturing to importing to uh, technology, real estate. Um, we pretty much are angel investors. So um, we go around and we just find different opportunities. We'll capitalize them um, or we'll add intellectual capital to them and then grow them and sell them. There's lots of opportunity, yeah. isn't there? Yeah. Massive. massive lots. Massive. They're constant, <laughs> Yeah. That's, that's why as we were cruising into a depression, you know, this is 2022, and uh, the Biden crime family has taken, my, my background is oil, and the moment he cut off the Keystone, it was his first act, I think, he cut off the Keystone XL pipeline, and the, I was selling oil at $30 a barrel, this is in 2000, and it went to $130 a barrel. I knew what he was doing. He was destroying, the, the poor are already toast but he was now going after the middle class. And that's why I call him the Biden crime family with all the greenies and all this stuff. I'm going, holy moly. You know, that's why I wrote Capitalist Manifesto. We've got to fight back with, with financial education. So thank you for doing that. So what, what did the cash flow? I mean, the cash flow game must torque your brain a little bit too, because you can see a different avenues, right, in, in life. Yeah, um, completely. So, you know, when my first, my mom first suggested the game to me, I was like, no, I don't want to play that. Like, some game about, like, life. Like, I'm nine years old. I don't want to play this. <laughs> Sorry, me young. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, as soon as I started to understand it, I was like, wait, this is this is exactly what, like, my parents do now. Like, I understand. Like, I never really understood what they did before. They were always just like, we're entrepreneurs. I'm like, what does that even mean? Like, so <laughs> this game kind of taught me exactly how they generated passive income and turned that into investing. And then, you know, they got out of the rat race with it. And and I love how the game um, emphasizes, too, that once you, like, reach your goal and you're out of the rat race and you have the passive income, you have you have a dream and you can achieve it and you can return that money back to charity and so I really emphasized that when I did a presentation in school too about how you like did a, how was that received? <laughs> well, um, the presentation, you know, the kids loved it. In my classroom afterwards, they were all like, "That was an amazing presentation." My teacher was not so fond of it because <laughs> <laughs> you know I did the presentation um, on the game cash flow, and um, one of my biggest points was about how. Um, I would rather end the game as a janitor rather than a doctor because a doctor has more liability than a janitor, so it's easier to get out of the rat race. And, um, yeah, so she did not like that point. Oh, of course. <laughs> I was putting in, when Kim and I were making that game, I said, let's, get, let's, let's put that in there. They're really upset, all the teachers. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's not how much money you make. Yeah. It's how smart. You know, the, as we go into this great depression, which we're going into globally because we have a liquidity crisis, I mean, actually, there's not enough money out there. Right. It's really quite interesting. But anyway, the greatest asset a person has is between the left ear and the right ear. And it's your responsibility as to what you put in it. And you can blame the schools, you can blame everybody else. 
but your greatest asset is your brain between your left ear and right ear, because it's also your greatest liability. Because if you've been programmed, you have to have job security and a steady paycheck, and you lose your job, like my poor dad did, it's over. Because you don't have the next brain cells to get to the next level. So what else, so what, in my final word, so what, so when you talk to your friends about the cash flow or whatever you talk about them about, what do you see your future going to be? Um, when I talk to my friends about the cash flow game, you know, well, my future, I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. You know, I'm about to take over one of my dad's businesses. With, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> with, good. Um, actually with someone in my school as well, because um, there are some entrepreneurial minds that want to know more outside of the education system. I think a lot of young people today are. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they just don't have the um, resources to learn or like understand. Right. So yeah, I definitely want to be an entrepreneur when I grow up, you know, learn investing, real estate. I do some with her now. And I it's just- It's exciting, isn't it? Yeah, it's really fun once you understand and it's it's not as complicated as it looks once you start to understand, right. you know, the basic cycle of it, but- It's like learning to walk. You'll fall down yeah, a number of times. Exactly, yeah. It's just the risk that's involved with it. And that's what fun. teachers tell you not to do. Yeah, exactly. Don't fall down. Yeah. You know, they, they teach you that there's, you can't make mistakes. There's only one right answer. You Exactly. Jeez, there's so much opportunity. So the final words, you know, when I talk to people about the cash flow board game is that we have a book called, a, uh, we, have a, we have a video that goes out that uh, we put together from the Rich Dad Company. It says there's two types of paper. You know, my poor dad wanted his PhD and my rich dad wanted his financial statement. And so cash flow basically teaches the financial statement. And when you go to your banker, your banker has never, my banker has never asked me, oh, what was your GPA? You know, <laughs> exactly. what college did you graduate from? They've never asked me that. All they want to see is my financial statement. Yet the academics think it's their PhD. Yeah. And unfortunately, I hate to say this, but when this next depression comes, this is 2022, we'll probably be in it hard at 2025. I hope I'm wrong but there's a lot of people gonna realize our PhD didn't protect them. And that's what my poor dad found out. So I, I thank you, Jennifer and Brianna, for being having the courage to speak out. We won't mention the schools you have gone to and may have to keep going to, to keep running, running from the academics. But anyway, thank you for your courage to speak out. Of course, yeah, I'm happy to be here. And we'll be right back. Mm -hmm.